Hi guys, um, so this is the second Tale of Two Cities video, no? Um, this is still present day Teacher Ing Ong. I thought that, um, past Teacher Ing Ong read the full chapter 5, but actually, for some reason, past Teacher Ing Ong skipped the first three pages. Or, um, I think the previous class had already read the first three pages, and so I, so Teacher Ing Ong just didn't do it. Past Teacher Ing Ong. And so present Teacher Ing Ong has to do it for you guys. But it's fine. This is actually one of my favorite scenes. Um, so I'm going to read the first part of this chapter and then we really will give it over to Past Teacher Ing Ong. I only realized it now, no? Um, when I was editing the video, I, I, I looked at it and I was like, shoot! The first, three, the first three to four pages of chapter five um, wasn't read out loud, and being the OC perfectionist that I am, I had to, I had to do it. Okay, um, I had to um, complete it. So, chapter five, the wine shop. I'll read the first, um, the first few pages, and then I really will give it over to Teacher Ing Ong. Okay, um, past. Teacher Ing Ong. Um, chapter 5, The Wine Shop. Again, this is one of my favorite scenes um, because um, of the foreshadowing. Um, th this scene really foreshadows what's going to happen in the story. Chapter 5, The Wine Shop. A large cask of wine had been dropped and broken in the street. The accident had happened in getting it out of a cart. The cask had tumbled out with a run, the hoops had burst, and it lay on the stones just outside the door of the wine shop, shattered like a walnut shell. All the people within reach had suspended their business or their idleness to run to the spot and drink the wine. The rough, irregular stones of the street pointing every way and designed, one might have thought, expressly to lame all living creatures that approached them, had dammed it into little pools. These were surrounded, each by its own jostling group or crowd, according to its size. Some men kneeled down, made scoops of their two hands joined, and sipped or tried to help women who bent over their shoulders to sip, before the wine had all run out between their fingers. Other men and others, men and women, dipped in the puddles with little mugs of mutilated earthenware, or even with handkerchiefs from women's heads, which were squeezed dry into infants' mouths. Others made small mud embankments to stem the wine as it ran. Others, directed by lookers on up at high windows, darted here and there to cut off little streams of wine that started away in new directions. Others devoted themselves to the sodden and lead-dyed pieces of the cask, licking and even champing the moist their wine-rotted fragments with eager relish. There was no drainage to carry off the wine, and not only did it all get taken up, but so much mud got taken up along with it that there might have been a scavenger in the street if anybody acquainted with it could have believed in such a miraculous presence. A shrill sound of laughter and amused voices, voices of men, women, and children, resounded in the street while this wine game lasted. There was little roughness in the sport and much playfulness. There was a special companionship in it, an observable inclination on the part of everyone to join some other one, which led, especially among the luckier or lighter-hearted, to frolicsome embraces, drinking of health, shaking of hands, and even joining of hands and dancing, a dozen together. When the wine was gone and the places where it had been most abundant were raked into a gridiron pattern by fingers, these demonstrations ceased as suddenly as they had broken out. The man who had left his saw sticking in the firewood he was cutting set it in motion again. The woman who had left on a doorstep the little pot of hot ashes at which she had been trying to soften the pain in her own starved fingers and toes or in those of her child returned to it. Men with bare arms, matted locks, and cadaverous faces who had emerged into the winter light from cellars moved away to descend again, and a gloom gathered on the scene that appeared more natural to it than sunshine. So, this cask of wine falls on the street, guys, and it spills everywhere. And all these these poor French people all rush towards it, and they start drinking the wine from the ground, no? Um, and it, it shows so much the poverty of the people, where imagine, like, so many 
people gathered around spilled wine and then they were kuno um licking the they were licking the ground they were cupping their hands and they were drinking it they were taking the dirt that mixed with it and they were eating the dirt they were um some of them even took the the wood no from the from the wine cast that broke and they were chewing it that's how starved these people were that in the middle of their work days um a cask of wine breaks no and spills over their street and they start drinking it okay um women kuno took their handkerchiefs and soaked it and then squeezed it into their mouth the smug that it, it shows how poor these people were and also it, it gives us a picture of of not only how poor they are but how desperate they are and how sort of like um starved they are and and again the foreshadowing is amazing good and wine it looks a lot like blood and there's gonna be a lot of contrast between wine and and blood in this story the wine was red wine and had stained the ground of the narrow street in the suburb of saint antoine in paris where it was spilled it had stained many hands too and many faces and many naked feet and many wooden shoes the hands of the man who had sawed the wood left red marks on the billets and the forehead of the woman who nursed her baby was stained with the stain of the old rag she wound about her head again those who had been greedy with the staves of the cask had acquired a tigerish smear about the mouth and one tall joker so besmirched, his head more out of a long squalid bag of a nightcap than in it, scrawled upon a wall with his finger dipped in muddy wine lees blood. The time was to come when that wine too would be spilled on the street stones, and when the stain of it would be red upon many there. And now that the cloud settled on Saint Antoine, which a momentary gleam had driven from his sacred countenance, the darkness of it was heavy, cold, dirt, sickness, ignorance, and want. Were the lords in waiting on the saintly presence, nobles of great power, all of them, but most especially the last, samplers of a people that had undergone a terrible grinding and regrinding in the mill? And certainly not in the fabulous mill which ground old people young, shivered at every corner, passed in and out at every doorway, looked from every window, fluttered in every vestige of a garment that the wind shook. The mill which had worked them down was the mill that grinds young people old. The children had ancient faces and grave voices, and upon them, and upon the grown faces, and plowed into every furrow of age and coming up afresh, was the sign, hunger. It was prevalent everywhere. Hunger was pushed out of the tall houses in the wretched clothing that hung upon poles and lines. Hunger was patched into them with straw and rag and wood and paper. Hunger was repeated in every fragment of the small modicum of firewood that the man sawed off. Hunger stared down from the smokeless chimneys and started up from the filthy street that had no offal among its refuse of anything to eat. Hunger was the inscription on the baker's shelves written in every small loaf of his scanty stock of bad bread, at the sausage shop in every dead dog preparation that was offered for sale. Hunger rattled its dry bones among the roasting chestnuts in the turned cylinder. Hunger was shred into atom atomies in every farthing porringer of husky chips of potato fried with some reluctant drops of oil. Its abiding place was in all things fitted to it, a narrow winding street full of offense. <gasps> Look who's here, grade 10. It's my niece, Lily. Hi. Say hi, Lil. Hi. Maybe you can stand up on your... Yeah. Wow. Hi, Lil. Look at the, cam Look at the camera. Right there. Where are you looking? Where are you looking? Where are you looking? Okay, okay, let's mm, go. It's okay. Let's go. It's so weird that she wasn't even... She didn't even exist last year. Um, You're gonna see Teacher Ngong from last year, no? He didn't have Lily yet. Which is so weird. In its abiding place was in all things fitted to it, a narrow winding street full of offense and stench, with other narrow winding streets diverging, all peopled by rags and nightcaps, and all smelling of rags and nightcaps, and all visible things with a brooding look upon them that looked ill. In the hunted air of the people there was yet some wild beast thought of the possibility of turning at bay. 
Depressed and slinking though they were, eyes of fire were not wanting among them, nor compressed lips white with what they suppressed, nor foreheads knitted into the likeness of the gallows rope they mused about enduring or inflicting. The trade signs, and they were almost as many as the shops were, all grim illustrations of want. The butcher and the porkman painted up only the leanest crags of meat, the baker the coarsest of meager loaves. The people rudely pictured as drinking in the wine shops, croaked over their scanty measures of thin wine and beer, and were gloweringly confidential together. Nothing was represented in a flourishing condition save tools and weapons. But the cutler's knives and axes were sharp and bright, the smith's hammers were heavy, and the gunmaker's stock was murderous. The crippling stones of the pavement, with their many little reservoirs of mud and water, had no footways, but broke off abruptly at the doors. The kennel, to make amends, ran down the middle of the street when it ran at all, which was only after heavy rains, and then it ran by many eccentric fits into the houses. Okay. Proof of how genius Dickens is, good guys, ha? Huh? Listen to his descriptions, good? You can just read this and, you know, be bored, no? But you can also read it and see the genius of Dickens, good? And the way he describes things. He said hunger was everywhere, good. Hunger was in everything. Everyone was hungry. But the people, they weren't dead, no? The, the people weren't, like, zombified. The people, they, they had an anger to them and they had a bitterness to them because of this hunger and he describes it so well good guys where the butcher could know what he paints on his signs when he's advertising is is meat that looks small and and gross and ugly because he because he doesn't like present his best his best pieces of meat he presents the thinnest and ugliest pieces of meat because he's bitter that he's so hungry the baker does the same thing he doesn't show his glorious loaves good no he shows like the driest pieces of bread as again a complaint on how poor they all are okay and he, they say he, um, Dickens wrote nga, the thing you'd go know everything shown was kind of ugly and pathetic but the only thing that was that was um, beautiful in this town were kind of their weapons the butcher knives okay um, the the axe the okay they were very sharp very shiny um so it's like the only thing that that was even like i don't know beautiful or well maintained in this city you no know, were the weapons okay and th these are weapons in the hands of people who are not only hungry but they are kind of they are they are brought to life by their anger because of how hungry they are. So oh my Dickens good. He's such genius writer, good see Dickens. And he describes things and again it's kind of tiring to go through description, but if you're reading it properly, you'll really be amazed at at him. And you really become smarter by reading him. Across the streets at wide intervals, one clumsy lamp was slung by a rope and pulley. At night, when the lamplighter had let these down and lighted and hoisted them again, a feeble grove of dim wicks swung in a sickly manner overhead, as if they were at sea. Indeed, they were at sea, and the ship and crew were in peril of tempest. For the time was to come when the gaunt scarecrows of that region should have watched the lamplighter in their idleness and hunger so long as to conceive the idea of improving on his method and hauling up men by those ropes and pulleys to flare upon the darkness of their condition. But the time was not come yet, and every wind that blew over France shook the rags of the scarecrows in vain, for the birds fine of song and feather took no warning all right and then past teacher ing ong finally started reading on his own um so he started here no the wine shop was a corner shop um and before we start we're going to be introduced to two characters um and i just wanted to introduce my casting our teacher kara and my casting for that we have defarge okay um which tom hardy is perfect for him good he's the wine shop owner and he has a wife madame defarge um her name's um and we chose jessica chastain for it so you're gonna meet these two characters in the coming paragraphs um so we're gonna time travel um to teacher ing ong a year ago I don't know where you 
where you stopped exactly. However, I want to, I'll just read it. I, I want to read through it. It's a good review for you guys said, okay? The wine shop was a corner shop better than most others in its appearance and degree. And the master of the wine shop had stood outside it in a yellow waistcoat and green breeches, looking on at the struggle for the lost wine. It's not my affair, said he, with a final shrug of his shoulders. The people from the market did it, let them bring another. Then his eyes happening to catch the tall joker writing up his joke, he called to him across the way. Say then, my Gaspard, what do you do there? Gaspard is the one who wrote blood on the wall. And we will have an actor for Gaspard, not in this PowerPoint, in the future na lang. Or um, we'll find a way. I didn't put the Gaspard yet, but Gaspard wrote the word blood on the wall. The fellow pointed to his choke with immense significance, as is often the way with his tribe. It missed its mark and completely failed, as is often the way with his tribe, too. What now? Are you a subject for the mad hospital? said the wine shopkeeper, crossing the road and obliterating the bridge a handful of mud, picked up for the purpose you write in the public streets. Is there, tell me thou, is there no other place to write such words in? In his expostulation, he dropped his cleaner hand, perhaps accidentally, perhaps not, upon the Joker's heart. Joker wrapped it his own, took a nimble spring upward, and came down in a fantastic dancing attitude with one of his stained shoes jerked off his foot into his hand and held out. A Joker of an extremely, not to say wolfishly, practical character, he looked under those circumstances. Put it on, put it on, said the other. Call wine, wine, and finish there. With that advice, he wiped his soiled hand upon the Joker's dress, such as it was quite deliberately as having dirtied the hand on his account, and then recrossed the road and entered the wine shop. This wine shopkeeper, so pause right now, so see, Defarge is, he said, you know, why are you writing this in a public place? He, he kind of didn't like that Gaspard wrote the word blood on the, on the wall because it's so public. He said, you know, don't write those things in public, are there not more private places to write these words in? And then he covered up the he covered up the word blood and then he kind of touched Gaspard's heart. Okay, he said now don't write it in public, write it in more private places. And then he touched the chest of Gaspard. So there's kind of like so there's secrecy. There is secrecy involved here. Defarge doesn't want the call of blood to be public. He wants it to be private. The heart of his fellow men, as opposed to advertised across the streets. Okay. The wine shopkeeper was a bull-necked, martial-looking man of 30, and he should have been of a hot temperament, for although it was a bitter day, he wore no coat, but carried one slung over his shoulder. His shirt sleeves were rolled up too, and his brown arms were bare to the elbows. Neither did he wear anything more on his head than his own crisply curling short dark hair. He was a dark man altogether with good eyes and a good bold breath breadth between them. Good humored looking on the whole, but implacable looking too. Evidently a man of a strong resolution and a set purpose. A man not desirable to be met rushing down a narrow pass with a gulf on either side, for nothing would turn the man. Madame Defarge's wife sat in the shop behind the counter as he came in. Madame Defarge was a stout woman of about his own age with a watchful eye that seldom seemed to look at anything. A large hand heavily ringed, a steady face, strong features, and great composure of manner. There was a character about Madame Defarge from which one might have predicted that she did not often make mistakes against herself in any of the reckonings over which she presided. Madame Defarge, being sensitive to cold, was wrapped in fur and had a quantity of bright shawl twined about her head, though not the concealment of her large rings. Her knitting was before her, but she had laid it down to pick her teeth with a toothpick. Thus engaged with her right elbow, supported by her left hand, Madame Defarge said nothing when her lord came in, but coughed, just one grain of cough. This, in combination with the lifting of her darkly defined eyebrows over her toothpick by the breadth of a line, suggested to her husband that he would do well to look round the shop among the customers for any new customer who had dropped in while he stepped over the way. So when Defarge entered, Madame Defarge was like, <coughs> she coughed and she kind of looked at him and that was a signal nga, you look around in our shop, look for customers who might have come in before you exited. So, or after you exited. So 
again, the Defarges are very secretive. They're very secretive people. The wine shopkeeper accordingly rolled his eyes about until they rested upon an elderly gentleman and a young lady who were seated in a corner. Other company were there, two playing cards, two playing dominoes, three standing by the counter, lengthening out a short supply of wine. As he passed behind the counter, he took notice that the elderly gentleman said in a look to the young lady, This is our man. What the devil do you do in that galley there, said Monsieur Defarge to himself. I don't know you. But he feigned not to notice the two strangers and fell into discourse with the triumvirate of customers who were drinking at the counter. How goes it, Jock? said one of these three to Monsieur Defarge. Is all the spilt wine swallowed? Every drop, Jock, answered Monsieur Defarge. When this interchange of Christian name was effected, Madame Defarge, picking her teeth with her toothpick, coughed another grain of cough and raised her eyebrows by the breadth of another line. It is not often, said the second of the three, addressing Monsieur Defarge, that many of these miserable beasts know the taste of wine or of anything but black bread and death. Is it not so, Jock? It is so, Jock, Monsieur Defarge returned. At this second interchange of the Christian name, Madame Defarge, still using her toothpick with profound composure, coughed another grain of cough and raised her eyebrows by the breadth of another line. The last of the three now said his say as he put down his empty drinking vessel and smacked his lips. Ah, so much the worse. A bitter taste it is that such poor cattle always have in their mouths and hard lives they live, Jock. Am I right, Jock? You are right, Jock, was the response of Monsieur Defarge. The third interchange of the Christian name was completed at the moment when Madame Defarge put her toothpick by, kept her eyebrows up, and slightly rustled in her seat. Hold and true, muttered her husband, gentlemen, my wife. The three customers pulled off their hats to Madame Defarge with three flourishes. She acknowledged their, hom their homage by bending her head and giving them a quick look. Then she glanced in a casual manner around the wine shop, took up her knitting with great apparent calmness and repose of spirit, and became absorbed in it. Gentlemen, said her husband, who had kept his bright eye observantly upon her, good day. The chamber furnished bachelor fashion that you wish to see and were inquiring for when I stepped out is on the fifth floor. The doorway of the staircase gives on the little courtyard close to the left here, pointing with his hand near to the window of my establishment. But now that I remember, one of you has already been there and can show the way. Gentlemen, a Jew. Okay. Very interesting. So he, there were two strangers sitting down there, an old man, an elderly man, and a young woman. So who do you think this is? This is? Who elderly man and young woman have we met so far in the story, okay? But Defarge didn't talk to them right away. He talked to these three guys, okay? So he talked to these three men and who are just kind of talking in the counter. And he said, like, oh, I don't know who you are. He kind of said, oh, I don't know who you are. But then they start talking and they call each other jock guys, okay? So um, all of them have the same name, okay? Jock, which is kind of like the French version of Jack. It's a very common name. And he's like, oh, Jock. And then, oh, Jock. And they kind of call each other Jock. And it's, it's, it's weird. All three of them, including Defarge, the three of them plus Defarge, their name is all Jock, or at least they all call each other Jock. So do you think their names are really all Jock? It sounds, it's weird, right? It feels like it's a, a code word or a code name. Okay, and because they're all funny, jock, and they really say the word jock good after every sentence. And then Madame Defarge is always just like, <clears throat> she kind of coughs and then looks up, coughs, looks up. And see, Defarge said, okay, the three jocks, the three of you, you can go to the, um, they were kind of asking for the, they wanted to see something. And he said, what you want to see, it's on the fifth floor. Go there, you can look at what you want to look at. So again, secrets, good kaya ni ang Defarge wine shop. There's something in the fifth floor that the three jocks want to look at. They paid for their wine and left the place. The eyes of Monsieur Defarge were studying his wife with her knitting when the elderly gentleman advanced from his corner and begged the favor of a word. Willingly, sir, said Monsieur Defarge, and quietly stepped with him to the door. Their conference was very short, but very decided. Almost at the first word, Monsieur Defarge started and became deeply attentive. It had not lasted a minute when he nodded and went out. The gentleman then beckoned to the young lady and they too went out. 
Madame Defarge knitted with nimble fingers and steady eyebrows and saw nothing. Mr. Jarvis, Gloria, and Miss Manette, emerging from the wine shop thus, joined Mr. Defarge in the doorway to which he had directed his other company just before. It opened from a stinking little black courtyard and was the general public entrance to a great pile of houses inhabited by a great number of people. In the gloomy tile-paved entry to the gloomy tile-paved staircase, Monsieur Defarge bent down on one knee to the child of his old master and put her hand to his lips. It was a gentle action, but not at all gently done. A very remarkable transformation had come over him in a few seconds. He had no good humor in his face, nor any openness of aspect left, but had become a secret, angry, dangerous man. It is very high. It is a little difficult. Better to begin slowly. Thus, Monsieur Defarge, in a stern voice to Mr. Lorry, as they began ascending the stairs. Okay, so Defarge used to be the servant of of the father of Lucy. All right, so I think it was mentioned in chapter four where um, they said, now we are going to go to an old servant of your father. He is the one keeping him now. All right, so Defarge is that servant. He used to be the servant of the father um, of Lucy. He's the one keeping the dad Langsak for now, okay? And then he, he, he kissed Lucy in the hand. He became very angry, even the th thinking about her father and what's happened to him. Murag, he, he seems more dangerous. And then he told Loring, it's we have to climb the stairs, okay? We have to climb up. Is he alone? The latter whispered. Alone. God help him. Who should be with him? Said the other in the same low voice. Is he always alone then? Yes. Of his own desire? Of his own necessity. As he was when I first saw him after they found me and demanded to know if I would take him and at my peril be discreet. As he was then, so he is now. So Laurie was like, is he alone up there? And then Laurie, and then see, Defarge is like, yeah, he's alone. And Laurie was, Laurie was like, why? He wants to be alone? And then Defarge said, he needs to be alone. Shady. Okay. He is greatly changed. Changed. The keeper of the wine shop stopped to strike the wall with his hand and mutter a tremendous curse. No direct answer could have been half so forcible. Mr. Laurie's spirits grew heavier and heavier as he and his two companions ascended higher and higher. So um, they, they begin to climb the steps of the wine shop. Pause it here, guys. I want you to I want you to continue reading. So all we know is that Defarge, whenever he talks about um, the father of Lucy, Murak, he's very triggered by it. He, he kind of banged his hand on the wall. He said a curse. Um, Muragda, the situation of the father makes him very mad. Okay, so just read the next paragraph until um, getting bis come now, business, business. Okay, so they're gonna just climb the stairs here, but it's described very well, guys. The 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 next few paragraphs are described so well. Pause pause the video here. And then continue playing when you've read up to. Um, that's well, friend Defarge. Come now. Business, business. And then we will continue reading. Okay, so pause. Okay, so let's continue. All right. So right now, let's go to Defarge. All right. So um, very well described, no? And Murag, he was like, I think he was talking where... They were talking very softly as they climbed the stairs. They went up slowly and softly. The staircase was short, and they were soon at the top. There, as it had an abrupt turn in it, they came all at once in sight of three men whose heads were bent down close together at the side of a door and who were intently looking into the room to which the door belonged, through some chinks or holes in the wall. On hearing footsteps close at hand, these three turned and rose and showed themselves to be the three of one name who had been drinking in the wine shop. So they climbed the stairs, they reached the door, and the three jocks were gathered around the door and peeking into the room. So the, 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 remember when Defarge said, like, the thing you want to see, it's in the fifth floor. They were on the fifth floor peeking in. And then Defarge is like, okay, go. You've seen what you need to see. Go now, Okay. 
I forget them in the surprise of your visit, explained Monsieur Defarge. Leave us, good boys. We have business here. The three glided by and went silently down, there appearing to be no other door on that floor, and the keeper of the wine shop going straight to this one when they were left alone, Mr. Lord him in a whisper, a little anger. Do you make a show of Monsieur Manette? I show him in the way you have seen to a chosen few. Is that well? I think it is well. Who are the few? How do you choose them? I choose them as real men of my name. Jock is my name. To whom the sight is likely to do good. Enough, you are English. There is that, that is another thing. Stay there if you please a little moment. So Mr. Laurie was really like, why are you showing him to other people? And Defarge is like, I only show them to men like me, men with my name, Jock. Because the sight of, of Mr. Manette will do good for men like me. With an admonitory gesture to keep them back, he stooped and looked in through the crevice in the wall. Soon raising his head again, he struck twice or thrice upon the door, evidently with no other, with no other object than to make a noise there. With the same intention, he drew the key across it three or four times before he put it clumsily into the lock and turned it as heavily as he could. The door slowly opened inward under his hand and he looked into the room and said something. A faint voice answered something. Little more than a single syllable could have been spoken on either side. He looked back over his shoulder and beckoned them to enter. Mr. Laurie got his arm securely round the daughter's waist and held her, for he felt the touch sinking. A business, business urge with a moisture that was not of business shining on his cheek. Come in, come in. I am afraid of it, she answered, shuddering. Of it? What? I mean of him, of my father. Rendered in a death by her state and by the beckoning of their conductor, he drew over his neck the arm that shook upon his shoulder, lifted her a little, and hurried her into the room. He set her down just within the door and held her, clinging to him. Defarge drew out the key, closed the door, locked it on the inside, took out the key again, and held it in his hand. All this he did method methodically and with a, a loud and harsh accompaniment of noise he could make. Across the room with a measured tread to where the window was. He stopped there and faced around. So Defarge didn't just barge into the room. He could he, he would kind of jiggle the knob. Um, he would put the key in, he would take it back out, he would be loud with the keys. Um so Murag, it's so weird, it's it's scary. Can you imagine if someone's gonna say, Okay, your father that you thought was dead is in this next room? And then the guy is kind of like putting the key in, making noises, being shady. So Lucy is so scared. And then Mr. Laurie is like, it's okay, it's okay. It's just business. It's just business. But Muragi has a moisture in his cheeks. So it's either tears or sweat. And he's kind of, it's very clear he's also scared. It's not just business. He's also feeling very like emotional about the, the situation. And... Courage, Langid Lucy. Be courageous. But Lucy's like, I'm scared. I'm scared of my father. The garret built. Okay. Um, the garret built to be a dry depository for firewood and the like was dim and dark. For the window of dormer shape was in truth a door in the roof with a little crane over it for the hoisting up of stores from the street unglazed and closing up the middle in two pieces like any other door of French construction. To exclude the cold, one half of this door was fast closed and the other was opened but a very little way. Such a scanty portion of light was admitted through these means that it was difficult on first coming in to see anything, and long habit alone could have slowly formed in anyone. The ability to do any work requiring nicety in such obscurity, yet work of that kind was being done in the garret, for with his back towards the door and his face towards the window, where the keeper of the wine shop stood looking at him, a white-haired man sat on a low bench, stooping forward and very busy making shoes. Okay, so it's very dark in the room. Okay, it's very, very dark. Um, and it's, 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 a, it's, it's, it's a strange, dark, scary room. And you can kind of hear sounds. And what do they find? They find a white-haired man sitting on a low bench, stooping forward and very busy making shoes. So they find an old shoemaker in the dark of that 
room. Okay, so that's the end of the chapter. Um, so we're gonna read chapter six. So I'm gonna start another video. So again, so this won't be too long. I'd rather you have a lot of little videos, short videos, Kaisa, it's one long video, but then we will um, continue, all right? So before we do that, the three jocks, you know, they were the ones gathering around the door. Chapter six, we are in the, cool. We are in the shoemaker now, okay?